Hello, my name is Allison Espinal, and today we will talk about deep learning for MIR applications, uh, which was an independent study that I did here at Boston University uh, under the supervision of Wayne Snyder. So what is MIR? Music information retrieval is the interdisciplinary science of retrieving information from music. Um, this involves uh, using computers usually to extract uh, certain features or certain qualities from um, raw music data. Uh, two MIR problems that we will be focusing on are genre classification as well as source separation. And we'll go a little bit more into detail on genre classification next. So genre classification is a problem which has as input a set of songs and as output an assignment of genre labels per song. Um, this Im could involve different methodologies uh, but are generally separated into traditional machine learning techniques and deep learning techniques. Traditional machine learning involves the process of feature extraction or feature engineering in which human intervention needs to happen and we need to make choices about which features are useful for the specific problem that we are solving. Uh, you also need to pick the right paradigm or the right algorithm to use um, for the particular problem that you will be using and we'll be looking at uh, some of these uh, in, in a little bit. So we're going to be using the uh, GTZAN genre classification data set, which has 10 genres and there are 100 songs associated per genre. So there's a total of 1,000 songs. Um, the data set also came with predetermined features, which are known to be good for this kind of classification. Uh, there's a little bit of a caveat there. I'll explain it later. But some of these are the chroma, SDFT, mean, and the variance of the same thing, um, the RMS, the spectral centroid, the MFCCs, and we will learn about these at a high level next. So chroma, um, at a very high level, basically describes the brightness of a sound. RMS, the root mean squared, describes the perceived loudness of a song, which is much better than the raw amplitude since um, music is waveform data and waveforms are always oscillating between um, some peak values and some um, low values. Uh, then there's MFCCs, which are the MEL frequency kepstrel coefficient, which um, are an approximation of how humans interpret frequency information or audio information. Um, you know, uh, audio signals can be represented in the time amplitude domain or the, uh, the frequency domain. So um, it's very uh, important that we um, also are, have a interpretation of, of these signals that uh, is close to how us humans perceive these signals. If you want to learn more about uh, more features in the audio space, you can read a large set of audio features for sound description, similarity and classification in the Cuidado project by Jeffrey Peters. Um, it was a great resource to read for this project and understanding some of the formulas and what's going on. And I definitely recommend it for everyone. So. The first uh, traditional machine learning technique we'll talk about is k-means clustering, which has as input a set of data, a set of data points that exist in some space, then we want to find um, centroids that minimize the distances between uh, certain data points that are assigned to a cluster around that centroid. So this is what's going on here. Um, you can see that this would be the computed centroid, and then these data points are closest to that centroid, therefore they're assigned this um, particular uh, cluster. And the parameter input is k, which will be the number of clusters uh, which we will be finding, aka the number of centroids as well. So our goal is to use k-means clustering as a bit of a sort of validation um, framework in which we want to see if when we have k equals 10, because there are 10 genres in the uh, data set, uh, we get the best result. So calculating the within cluster sum of squares, which essentially is um, what's the distance between uh, the data points in a specific uh, cluster from, uh, from the centroid. And uh, we can see that uh, the actual number of K here, uh, which is 10, which is, I guess, the optimal one, doesn't really, it's not within the context of 
what I would say is like good change. Usually when we're doing k-means clustering, we want to choose a value that's somewhere around here at the elbow of the curve because every single other value, uh, uh, like increment of k, uh, implies a very marginal decrement in the actual um, error uh, or distance. So it's a little bit of a telltale sign that we did pretty bad. So we, uh, this is one of the clusters from running the algorithm with k equals 10. So what, the opt what we would consider the optimal solution. We could see that not only were there 220 songs instead of 100 assigned, but also the genres inside of the cluster are like all over the place. It's not as homogenous as we would want it to go. We would want each cluster to be mostly blues or mostly classical or mostly country. And that is clearly not what we got here. The next framework we'll be talking about is Naive Bayes, which uh, rests upon two assumptions. The first one being that all the predictions and the features are independent events and that all the predictions also have an equal outcome, uh, uh, sorry, an equal effect on the outcome. And essentially what's going on here is that we're using uh, some probability rules and facts, uh, such as Bayes' theorem, to calculate the probability that um, a song is a particular is of a particular genre given a, a particular set of features for that song. So in this case, we can use Bayes' theorem, finagle it a little bit, and find a way to get all the probabilities and then choose the, um, and then choose the uh, genre that maximizes the probability. And that would be our label assignment. Uh, this function here is is merely using some of the facts above and Bayes' theorem to make it easy to get the actual probabilities from the data. Uh, and then we use Naive Bayes, a specific subset of Naive Bayes called Gaussian Naive Bayes, which assumes our data points come from a Gaussian distribution or a normal distribution, which gives us this probability for um, each of the features given a particular genre to calculate it on the data set. And what we got was 26.5% accuracy. We trained our model on 80% of the songs and then tested the predictions on a on 20% of the data set, which was disjoint from the training set. And yeah, we did pretty bad. So we need to understand a little bit of why this might have been the case. So my sort of informal explanation as to why this is the case is because music is time dependent data. And in the data set that we used with the uh, data that we were given and also in the um, paradigms that we chose to use, um, time sensitive data is, not, is clearly not present. And I believe that that gets rid of a lot of the nuances that basically yield the differentiations that we can tell right away. Uh, even though, well, this is maybe a little bit of a generalized statement, but when you hear, a cl like for example, classical music and electronic music, you can clearly tell what, what genre they should go on. And I believe the change in the music over time is very important. Um, compared to, for example, here, MFCCs um, are time dependent and for each coefficient is time dependent. And in the data that we used, we merely grabbed the mean over all time and the variance over all time, which simply it was not enough and didn't have enough dimensionality to it. So as a solution, um, we want to introduce another paradigm called uh, deep learning which is a relatively end-to-end -end process in which we don't have to do much uh, feature extraction or feature engineering because the feature extraction part of, the, of deep learning is incorporated into the learning process. So the deep learning uh, model will extract the features as, as it trains and as it learns. And that way the, there's less of a human interaction component. Uh, into it and also it's very it's much easier to include time dependent information into a deep learning network and we will see how these work next so a lot of what uh, I'm going to be talking about was based off of a YouTube series by Valerio Velardo who has a um, an audio technology company and did a very great series 
um, called Deep Learning for Audio with Python under his YouTube channel called The Sound of AI. You should definitely check it out and you'll learn a lot of, of what I'm talking about here. So essentially, deep learning rests upon the very important notion of what a neural network is and an artificial neuron. So an artificial neuron seeks to imitate um, how real neurons work and also uh, collectively, when you have many neurons in a network, how humans learn and how the human brain learns. So I don't know how real neurons really work, but at this point, I know a little bit more about how fake neurons work, which is with an input that gets um, a weighted sum. So you can think of this as a, if this is a vector, this is a matrix operation. And then the results from this operation gets fed into an activation function, which then becomes our output. And this is the same thing quote unquote, uh, or is a simulation of um, when you have a neuron and you have its inputs and then you get uh, the output on the other side of the neuron. So as I said before, when you have many artificial neurons, you essentially end up with a neural network. And the part that makes it a deep neural network is what I mentioned before with the feature extraction and also that there is uh, these different layers called hidden layers, um, which have an, many neurons working together and then they feed into each other, which is really cool. Um, and then the way that these learn uh, are through some algorithms called forward propagation and back propagation. Furthermore, uh, we also need to learn a, bit, a little bit more about activation functions. So this one right here is called a sigmoid function. It uh, it's called sigmoid because it looks like an S if you were to graph it out. And then there's the rectifying linear unit, which is ReLU, um, which is like zero for a little bit until you basically get uh, a linear line. Uh, for the next set of examples that we will be showing, we'll be uh, assuming that our activation function f is sigmoid. Okay, cool. So this is the multilayer perceptron, which is an example of a very, 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 very simple neural network. And our goal is to perform Ford's propagation on it um, and make a prediction on the data because that's essentially what the uh, Ford's propagation algorithm does. It makes a prediction. And we're doing exactly what I mentioned earlier, which is feeding the input um, into the network, it gets a weighted sum, then the activation function is calculated on the weighted sum, then for the next component we do another weighted sum right here, this is essentially all these arrows here, and then the output from that gets fed into the activation function again, which would be sigmoid, and y, which is the result of the activation function, is the output of our network, which is great. Now we've made a prediction. And from the prediction, we can make a, uh, we can estimate an error and see how off it was from the ground truth. Here, this is why true is the ground truth, why pred is the pr prediction that we've just made with the network. And if we calculate the um, mean squared error here, in this case, uh, we have an error function. And after we have an error function, we can then try to see how to um, finagle the weight, which which is essentially what we're learning in the neural network. We're learning which weights to use to make accurate predictions um, for a specific problem. And then we want to conduct a back propagation. So um, after we, we've calculated our error, we're essentially going backwards in the network and we're going to be calculating the gradient of the error function um, with respect to the weights. So how does the error function change based off of the um, weight values. And then with some calculus, we can, you know, calculate a lot of these, um, a lot of these values. There's a lot of um, the chain rule involved here and a lot of uh, good old derivative rules going on. And then once we have the gradient, which are these derivatives here, we can perform gradient descent, which is essentially, now that we know how the weights are changing or what the derivative um, of the error function uh, with the weights is, we can then go against the gradient, which will uh, lead us to a lower or local minima in the error function. Thus, we can minimize the error or how wrong our prediction is and yield better results. All right, so the overall with neural networks, we want to train our network on a subset of the data uh, and then make predictions after we've trained it using backpropagation and for propagation on a subset of the data that is completely disjoint from the training set. And then we want to make some assessment on the performance of the predictions that we've made with our model.
So you could either do this from scratch if you're trying to learn a lot and also have a lot of time on your on your plate, which is not the case with me. So you can easily do this with TensorFlow and Keras and a couple of lines of code. It's very useful and it's very cool, very great. So I kind of lied to you earlier by saying that uh, deep learning is end-to-end. -end. Well, just kind of, because there's a little bit of data pre-processing that you got to do beforehand. And it seems a lot like feature engineering, but it, it kind of isn't, kind of is. I'm still kind of ambivalent about it. Um, but we want to actually extract the MFCCs from the music data. We don't want to use the raw um, like time domain, like time amplitude domain uh, data from the songs because we want to make sure that the network is interpreting the music, how humans would interpret music. The way that you would calculate the MFCCs is essentially by getting the raw uh, signals, calculating the short time for your transform of the signals, which is essentially the frequency representation uh, or the frequency domain representation of the sounds, which show you per um, like instance of time, which frequencies are most present. I think this is a rather like intuitive thing to understand. Um, and if you don't, it's based off of the fact that um, you can show any real music signal as a sum of sine wave components, each of which has an independent pitch. It's very interesting. If you've ever heard a tuning fork, for example, uh, you can essentially recreate any, um, any sound as, as if it was the sum of different tuning forks with different pitches and different amplitudes as well as different phase, which is basically just the location of the signal, how, how it's shifted. But that's uh, besides the point. We also want to pass the STFT through Melband uh, filters, which is a filter that um, gets rid of certain frequencies and such, um, and also makes it so that the data is split into specific bands that represent bands of frequencies that humans can't tell apart. So if you were to show uh, human beings, certain frequencies in a particular band, they're, they're all coming from the same band, it would be hard for people to say that they are a different pitch, even though they have different frequencies. Um, after that, you take the, the what's called the kepstrom of that, which is essentially just taking the log of what we've just did, uh, of what we just did, sorry. And after you take the logarithm of the kepstrom, we want to uh, take the discrete um, cosine transform, which all you need to know about that, or all I really know about that, is that it makes it so low energy components of what we of the capstrom here uh, don't have too much power over the signal, and this is what we get. We've we've seen this picture a couple of times now, but each of these over here it would be one of the MFCCs or one of the coefficients of the uh, MFCCs. All right, so now we have our data like we want it, and we want to build a network, pass it through and get some uh, genre labels from it. So we're gonna pass in the song MFCCs and the labels associated with each of these uh, through a network which has a flatten layer which will turn our input into one dimensional data. And then our network has uh, four layers, three of them are hidden layers with 512, 256, and 64 neurons each. And the activation function is the ReLU. And then for the fourth layer is our, just our output layer with, with a softmax, which turns each of the results into a probability between zero and one. So we have 10 here because of the genre labels. Um, so then for each of the outputs, we want to, which represent a genre, we want to pick the one that has the largest value, so the largest probability. And the, uh, the genre with the highest probability is the one that gets assigned the specific genre label. All right, cool. So these are the results after 100 epics of training and um, testing on some data. So uh, we see that there is a very high accuracy on the test data. However, uh, not so great um, training accuracy. There's a bit of a discrepancy here, both in the error function and in the accuracy function here. And this is due to a problem called overfitting, which we need to resolve. And in order to resolve this, uh, so that these um, training and testing sets have pretty equal um, or rather like pretty close results. We want to perform uh, two uh, operations which are called regularization, which is an extension of the error function, which uh, penalizes uh, like large weights uh, such that like specific features um, have uh, or like giving large 
uh, weights to specific features or specific outputs from networks um, is penalized. And also dropout, which is randomly dropping neurons in the networks so that the network doesn't heavily rely on the uh, specific neuron's output, for example. After doing this, we essentially have the exact same architecture, except we're, we have an L2 regularizer, which um, uses the L2 norm of the weight uh, to penalize, and also a 30% dropout on the hidden layers. We get a uh, much better um, overfitting performance. Rather, there's a lot less overfitting going on. Uh, however, there's a little bit of a decrement in the accuracy overall, um, which... You know, you know, we can solve by doing more epics or doing, uh, well, the error function already is pretty low, but we could also just increase the data set. But we can also go and just choose a completely different paradigm. So we want to talk about uh, convolutional neural networks, which have been really good for like image processing and image information. They're kind of standard there because they have really, really high performance. And you might say, but we're dealing with music, like that's that's not images. And I'm just gonna tell you that uh, that's a lie. So music information can be presented uh, at its simplest case as as frequency and time information, like I said before. You know, the sum of of sine waves or pitchforks going on at once can represent any any real sound signal. Um, and this this is essentially a graph of the spectrogram. Um, which is based off of the short time Fourier transforms magnitude. Uh, phase is another concept, which is just the location of each of these uh, sine waves, but that's a little bit more complicated. So this is a essentially an image. So you can perform image operations on the on, on the sound data. Uh, and in our case, we can also do the same thing on MFCCs since they're essentially based off of the SDFT anyway. So yeah, this is this is something that's super useful and can be really accurate and, and give great results. All right, so convolutional neural networks, essentially the, the, the problem is that you have some input quote unquote image. In our case, there's gonna be the MFCCs, right? And then you have a kernel that gives you an output and you essentially want to learn what the values of the kernel are. So the kernel is going to be uh, like a small matrix similar to um, the big matrix that represents our data or the MFCCs. And you're gonna be sliding the kernel around through, um, the, through the input and performing the dot product with the values that it overlaps, ov overlaps with and then putting that onto the output and do that many times. So there's different parameters also involved. For example, what's the size of the kernel or how, how are you going to move through, 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 the, through the input? Like how, how, how are you going to skip? That's called stride. There's also depth, which is the dimensionality of the data. For example, if you have image that is colored based, there's going to be different channels like the red uh, channel, the, the green channel and the blue channel. And also you might have a lot of kernels. You, that's another parameter. And then there's also the concept of pooling, which is essentially image down sampling. Um, so you uh, would uh, take the, for example, the average or the, the maximum value of a, of a specific grid. It's very similar to the whole kernel process. And that would reduce the dimensionality. And there's a reason why we're doing this. So the reason why we're also doing pooling and also doing everything else that I've mentioned about convolutional neural networks is because you want to go from low level to high level features. If you have some input data, you want to go from like more um, super low level, super basic features, such as, for example, what I'm thinking of as like pixels. From there, you want to go to lines. From lines, you want to go to shapes. And from shapes, you can go to objects. And from objects, you can go to... Um, I don't know, literally anything, the sky's the limit, you know? Um, so from there, you can do this reduction of, of, of the size and also uh, an, an increase of the level of the features. And from there, you can make a prediction. In this case, this picture is just showing the process when trying to label a, ca a car. All right, so what are we gonna do with our network? We're gonna have a convolutional, a two-dimensional two convolutional layer with uh, 32 neurons and uh, three by three filters. Then 
we have a max pooling layer, uh, which we did earlier. So this takes the max when it does the pooling. Uh, oh, actually, there's three of these. Yes, there's three of these. And then there's, there's also go some um, what's called batch normalization going on. Afterwards, we have a dance layer. So back to traditional neural networks, which also flattens the output of our three convolutional neural networks and uh, has ReLU as the activation function. And yeah, after that, we then also have our like 10 output layers and we're essentially doing the same thing with the labeled probabilities and choosing the one with the highest probability. And from here, we got pretty good results. We have 82% uh, accuracy on the test set and 68% accuracy on the training test, which which is all right. It's, it's pretty good. Uh, you may be asking for more though. You're like, ooh, this is dope. Like we should get some more stuff going on. So then this is where we end up with recurrent neural networks, which are very good for time series data with variable length, which is literally music. Music is time variable. So we're, this is a great, great, great thing here. And essentially what you have with recurrent neural networks is you have these cells. If you get the reference, you're a homie. And we give the cells an input. It'll calculate some state vector, which gets fee, uh, uh, feed it to the next step in, in the recurrence relation uh, of, of the network. So essentially you calculate some output um, and you calculate the state vector, which is initially randomized, I believe. And then you do the same thing for the next step and for the next step and for the next step and for the next step, so on and so on. Um, yeah, you. this is essentially doing the same thing. And there's a dense layer here with the output. And your goal is to learn the weights that go into uh, feeding into the cell um, the weights for the state vector and the weights for the y output here. Uh, so yeah, you want to learn u, v, and w, and you have, of course, activation functions going on, and that's very important. There's a, also an extension to recurrent neural networks called long short-term memory cells. So in a RNN, like the simple case where we saw before, um, the state vector is simply just goes back to like the previous iteration of the current relation, which is barely time, uh, like um, memory information. So if we do a long short term memory cell, we have another state vector called C, which essentially holds information from much more far in the past, not like forever ago, but like a significant amount of time in the past. So it's uh, it has memory that is beyond just the previous uh, state in the iteration. So we're going to be using this with uh, uh, LSTM that has uh, 64 units uh, it's a, and it's going to be sequence data. And um, so it's going to return a sequence rather than return, for example, a vector. These are the two different kinds of, of LSTMs or RNNs is they can either return just a state vector at the very end or they can return like each of the Ys um, that there are outputted. And, and then we have another layer. And then again, our good old ReLU dense layer with our output layer and uh, label probabilities, which get, get chosen based off which one uh, is highest to assign a genre. All right, so after just 30 epo epochs, which is about a third of, of the number of epochs we've been doing before, we get 59% uh, test accuracy and 56% training accuracy, which is really good considering that the, you know, the number of epochs we've done is much lower. And uh, you can see how increasing the number of um, data points uh, would really, or also increasing the number of epochs would really benefit this and how this is like super, super promising. So that's pretty much the end with regards to genre classification. So I want to talk about uh, a different topic, which is the original inspiration behind this whole project, which was source and stem instrument separation, which is the problem that has as input a specific song. And then from there, you want to extract the different instrument layers that created that song. Uh, there's a standard by native instruments that a lot of DJs and producers use called stems, which essentially just separates it into vocals, other bass and drums, considering that a lot of music has a very large variety of um, instruments, but a lot of popular music, especially anything that's based off of 
um, for example, West African music, so any kind of pop, jazz, rock, any of that it essentially would fall into this category. You could put piano, guitar, all those melodic and harmonic instruments into the other. There's usually vocals, there's usually bass, and then there's usually drums. Um, I came um, across this topic thanks to a library called Splitter by a company called Deezer, which does exactly the same thing. And it was actually shown to me by one of my favorite music producers and uh, tutorialists for music production on YouTube called Mr. Bill. Um, and uh, Azuki, who made a Max for Live device, Max for Live is um, a way of using a Max MSP inside of Ableton, uh, which is a digital audio workstation which basically wraps around the Deezer library so that you can use it within Ableton for any sort of um, musical proce uh, process. So yeah, let's dive in and see how it all works. So this is a quick demo of Splitter with one of my tracks called Melancholy. <laughs> So you just heard the original source, as well as the compilation of all four stems, which are in blue, and now you only have the bass playing. Now it's just the drums. And the others. Now, while this track doesn't really have vocals, some parts of the others, quote-unquote, actually bled into the vocal part, even though there aren't any vocals in the track. Now let's just hear that same section from the original for comparisons. So you can hear that from the splitter results, there's a lot of phasiness and a lot of weird sounds going on and things are bleeding into each other and it's not quite perfect. It's okay at extracting drums, but anything melodic, it has a lot of trouble with. Um, bass, it's okay, but it's also really phasey and it doesn't have that same oomph and that uh, same sense of centrality that is usually associated with bass and that's why i wanted to learn a little bit more about how this all works so you heard how that sounds so how does it all work really so essentially what they're doing and this is straight from a paper that they've posted for the ismir conference which is a music information retrieval conference it's very cool um they're using a unit model um which is essentially an implementation or like a different implementation of convolutional neural networks, which has been seen to be pretty good for um, like uh, source separation in general in like biomedical settings. And they're essentially uh, using this paradigm on input mix spectrograms. So as we mentioned before, it's going to be just the, the, the frequency information from there and then they're taking a they're essentially creating a soft mask which is saying okay this frequency should have should be at like 50 percent loudness at this particular period of time should be at 100 here should be zero here etc cetera, etc cetera. by training on the different in in instrument parts for a song and then they have these different soft masks for for each of the instruments that get applied to the song and from there you can uh, isolate the the instruments or the stems. Simplified, here it is. You essentially have uh, four different models, which are all based off of the same unit model, and you get the soft, ma soft masks, which get essentially multiplied by the song, and then you get the drums and the vocals, other and bass. As I was learning more about this, there's other approaches which are quote-unquote simpler. In this case, this is a binary masks, uh, it's doing exactly the same thing as before, except you're using a more traditional convolutional neural network approach to calculate binary masks, which are, instead of uh, having this middle ground, they have this like zero and one approach. Uh, and the results are actually fairly similar to that of Splitter. And even though it's 
a simpler approach it's still super complicated like the these are this, this is the architecture for the networks which is if you want to zoom in and learn a little bit more about it go to the link you can do that but it's complicated <laughs> All right, so my question was, but what about phase? So phase is a very important part of the um, Fourier transform and in part also the short time Fourier transform or the time dependent Fourier transform, which are the same, essentially the same thing, just different ways of calculating it. Um, so each signal in the time amplitude domain has a Fourier transform or time dependent for a transform in this case, which could be broken down into its magnitude, which is seen here is the absolute value of the Fourier transform. And it's just the loudness of each of the, its frequency components. And also the phase, which is like how offset is each of these sine waves or frequency components. And you can think about it, how you have a squiggly boy as your sine wave. And it's, it's like that, that plus component which basically shifts where it starts and uh that's essentially phase and it's just super important it's the reason why the Fourier transform actually uses what are called these complex exponentials which sort of embody the concept of phase and magnitude into one in here and if you were to graph for example the magnitude of sorry the spectrogram of the magnitude you get this image we've seen many times before and if you were to graph the phase you get this very strange mumbo jumbo all right so from there i went on to investigate a little bit more about the ways that you can incorporate phase into the uh equation of uh source separation since for example, Splitter in the in the previous more simpler uh, example that I was showing was merely working off of spectrograms. And my original thought was that you can uh, also tr train to get the right phase. However, uh, after reading this very cool paper called Improving DNN-Based Music Source Separation Using Phase Features, I learned that perhaps that's not the right approach and that there are other approaches that may be a little bit promising with a little bit of a start <laughs> or caveat to it. All right, so the this paper uh, analyzed different approaches, um, which all included phase in one way or another. So the first approach is amplitude estimation from the mixture amplitude. So essentially all you're, all you're doing is what Splitter and the previous thing did, which is just creating uh, an estimation of the soft masks or an estimation of the of the spectrogram Me simply based off of the short time Fourier transform um, the amplitude component of it because you can't have complex numbers in a neural network yet or at least in most implementations of neural network software um, and then the phase is merely passed uh, on as the same without any change and then the inverse short uh, short time Fourier transform is computed so that you can go back to the actual uh, like amplitude and time domain of the signal and you can actually listen to and hear what it would sound like the other category would be um, estimating the phase as alongside estimating the magnitude and this is what I thought of. This was my original thought that could be helpful because like, how do you know that the phase uh, is right or that the phase isn't the reason why in our example, it sounded kind of weird. And then the approach that they actually end up going with is actually using phase information to help the estimation of the right magnitude and still using the input phase uh, when calculating back to the, um, to the time domain representation of the signal. So they found out that approach B has a 122% improvement over approach A. Approach A being the simplest um, sort of splitter way of doing things or, or the, from that um, uh, blog that I read. And then that approach C only has a 57% improvement over approach A. So the bottleneck really is on the, um, on the magnitude estimation anyways. And the phase is for now pretty okay. All right, so phase plus plus. This means to me that there's a little bit more than just using the phase and like how is the phase actually helping the magnitude estimation? So there's actually a relationship 
between the derivatives with respect to time and to with respect to frequency in the time dependent or short time Fourier transform. Um, so between the phase and the uh, the derivatives of the phase and the derivatives of the log amplitude here. And this this is it. This is the relationship. So this would be in the continuous domain. And since we're you know modern computing, we need to uh, make sure this is in the discrete domain, which is which merely uses subtraction to calculate derivatives because that's what we can do. That's all we can do really. All right, another thing is that we have to fix some shifts in the phase that result from the short time Fourier transform. You can see that there's a little bit of finagling that goes on when you calculate the, um, what's called the discrete Fourier transform for each slice of time in the signal, which is essentially how you do the short time Fourier transform. And we need to correct it by a certain amount. And this is what they did here. This is the before and this is the after. And then the phases are uh, go along with a more um, Gaussian distribution. All right, so as I said before, there needs to be that pre-processing of the data to calculate what we showed earlier with the relationship between magnitude and phase. So we're doing exactly that for both um, derivatives with respect to time and frequency. And after doing that, we can input it through this really complicated layer, which does the data augmentation with the phase. And then that gets uh, the signal inputted into the short time Fourier transform. And then we split them into the phases and such, which get put into different networks for the bass, the drums, other, and vocals. Then we have each of the amplitudes now. And then the original phase is passed in. Then you compute the um, inverse short term Fourier transform. And then you need to use what's called a multi-channel Weiner filter to get rid of certain noise. And that way you get the predictions here, the predicted bass, the predicted drums, other and vocals. If you want to zoom in into one of these um, deep neural networks here, we can see that there's these input layers and some um, pre-processing happens on the amplitudes. And then you have these separate dense layers with ReLU that are done separately for the derivatives of the phase, which then get concatenated with the amplitude information. And from there you get the actual amplitude prediction that you get at the end here. All right, so some results from it, we can see that uh, after a concatenation and all that stuff, there's a 6.17% uh, improvement on bass, 0.64 on drums, 3.11 on other, and 0.84 on vocals. So a lot of the improvement that that happened, which is based off of what's called the signal to uh, distortion ratio, um, happened on the bass, which is a little bit what they talked. This improvement is kind of marginal. It's a little small. Um, but there may be some ways to increase it later on. So there are some observations that I did here. As I mentioned before, the improvement is kind of small. And if we wanted to see a larger improvement, we might want to use some of the other techniques that we saw earlier, for example, using LSTM RNNs or using UNETs like Splitter did. Like what would happen if we have this um, phase uh, inclusion to, of learning the spectrograms, but we also did uh, LSTMs or UNETs. Um, or maybe the problem is that we don't have enough data and we need we just need more of it, more data, more data, more data of different genres and different sound and frequency information. And after that, maybe we will see some improvements of the problem and you won't get that super phasey, weird sounding predictions. All right, so also I wanted to talk about like, why, why does it matter? Like, why do you want to separate songs into their components? So source separation actually has a lot of uses. Source separation can be super great for creativity. Um, a lot of musicians, especially in like the hip hop and electronic music space, love uh, sampling and remixing culture. Of course, this is within legal bounds and I'm not gonna comment on that, but a lot of great, classics in those genres of music and spaces have been done through sampling of of songs other people have made and when you get the different components of a song you just have so much more 
room for change and utilizing these things in really clever ways and it's super cool another technique that i'm thinking of is let's say you have a really really old song that's really poor quality and needs to be for example remixed or remastered a uh, mixing engineer might have an easier time remastering if um, they are able to have access to the different components of the song in the case in which you'd no longer have the stems or the different components of, of the song from when it was recorded because it was lost due to history and time. And then the other one, the other case that I'm thinking of is a educational purpose. So if you are a young uh, musician just learning how to play the guitar or learning how to play drums, I'm a drummer, so I'm, I'm very biased in that. And uh, Or when I learn how to play bass or sing or whatever, it's, it's really useful to have an isolation of, let's say, your favorite drummer. Uh, like I'd want to hear, for example, an isolation of Matt Garska, an isolation of one, some of the greats like Vinnie Kaliuta or um, Steve Gadd. Like having these recordings of what they did on legendary songs that have left a mark on history allows you to pay more close attention to what they're doing and perhaps improve your own playing um, and after you you know imitate the greats could expand on your own sound and uh, find your own inner voice so this is this is just super exciting for me and I think it's it's something that I would love to see and continue to improve as c technology and um, people's ideas uh, become more advanced regarding the topic. So yeah, that's all folks. That's all I had to really say. Um, it was really fun compiling all of the information from everything that I've learned over the semester. And I hope that you enjoyed learning about this new topic or if you already knew a little bit about it to see these different applications and how it can work and the possibilities that you have with it. Thank you so much and contact me if you have any other questions.